This uh, brief lecture reviews just some concepts from accelerometers that can be helpful in their selection and use in the lab. And um, it's intended to be brief, so it's not really meant to give a whole lot of theory, uh, only some basic background knowledge. I'm going to review um, how, and to show briefly how accelerometers um, rely on the mass spring damper system that they're constructed on. So those dynamics tend to influence some of the key specifications that we'll talk about. And these specifications are the ones that I want to uh, think can be helpful to you when you're um, using either an accelerometer that's provided to you or if you're trying to um, buy or select one for a certain application. So I'm going to talk about the range, which is obviously the the range of acceleration that can be measured, usually telling you the uh, upper limit uh, acceleration that can be measured. Sensitivity is sort of like a calibration. The unique thing about the accelerometer, it's really the first sensor that, at least in this course, that you will be looking at that that um, is, is dependent on both the amplitude of the input, in this case acceleration, but it also depends on the range of frequencies that um, that that the input vibration may um, exhibit. So, this uh, range of frequencies we call bandwidth sort of defines the lower and upper values of vibration frequency, and um, the the bandwidth has to do with <clears throat> the frequency response of the mass spring damper system uh, in the accelerometer. And uh, sometimes frequency response is a um, topic that you'll cover in more detail in, uh, in your lecture course in dynamic systems. We may have a future lab where we'll talk more about frequency response. In this context, I really just want you to have an idea of, of how to read bandwidth specifications in the context of accelerometer usage. So as I've said, accelerometers are mass spring damper systems. They're basic sided, so you've seen this figure before. You have a, in this case, we we'll call it a seismic mass. It's it's the mass inside the accelerometer that's responding, in a sense, to acceleration of the base. And we show stiffness and damping elements here. This particular uh, stiffness, you you should think of as you know, it's a restraining element, but it also tends to be, in most accelerometers, associated with the mechanism that is responsible for sensing, uh, if you like, the, um, the forces on the inertial mass. So in that sense, it can, it can sense, by sensing inertial force, it's sensing acceleration, right? So I'll show you a couple of different ways that that's done in commonly uh, used accelerometers. So uh, one uh, type of accelerometer uses typically a beam-like configuration. This shows really a, um, a MEMS, you know, solid-state type accelerometer. Usually a, a beam configuration will be made and there'll be essentially strain gauges, not unlike the beam sensor that we've used in the lab. Imagine if you shook that whole beam uh, structure up and down, the a mass at the end of that beam would tend to vibrate up and down. In fact, you could use that whole string gauge beam uh, sensor like an accelerometer. And that's what these right uh, microscale accelerometers are, are basically trying to achieve. Nice thing about these piezo accelerometers is they do have a kind of like a static-like response and I'll say a little bit more of that about that shortly. Other accelerometers use capacitive type elements so I'm using this as an opportunity to introduce a new type of sensing element. We've talked about resistive type sensors. Capacitive sensors, not unlike resistive, or we also talked about um, uh, LVDTs that are inductive, all of these right take advantage of changes in material or geometry. 
So imagine if you had two plates, if one of those plates is a mass, you accelerate up that they'll have some change in say the distance between the plates, you can have a change in capacitance and thus you can use that to detect acceleration. And in fact, this next slide here, this ADXL05 is actually the accelerometer that's embedded inside the um, accelerometers that we're using in this course at this time. And what you have is, may not be not clear, but you have this uh, elastic structure that holds uh, basically a center plate between two other fixed plates. And if you imagine this line here is your sensitive axis, as you accelerate in this direction, as it's shown here, you have an applied acceleration. You see these structures act as the, the springs, as the stiffness elements. And then you have the masses, that whole plate there. And then it's positioned between those two plates. So it's this change between these two plates, the differential change in capacitance that's detected with signal conditioning. And that's how another micro scale type accelerometer is made using a capacitive type sensing element. Another very common type of accelerometer uses a piezoelectric type sensor element. Piezoelectric is a little bit like capacitive except it uses these ceramic type crystals. Um, it's difficult to see here but you have these mass elements it's kind of oddly shaped with the rounded edges here between a fixed element and then it's it's this actually this area in between here that is the piezo crystal. This is a shear type, so this is a sensitive axis going up and down. And those elements in here are sheared. You know, this is the seismic mass as the accelerometer is accelerated up and down. The mass and that st structure here, the central post, shear this element. So this is a shear type piezoelectric. This is a compression type. The piezo element is at the bottom here, and this mass element here sitting on top of that uh, is the mass spring configuration, right? So that piezo crystal is now being uh, compressed, so this is compression type. Uh, piezoelectrics do not hold um, static force very well, and or what I'm trying to say actually is they don't hold the charge under static load very well. And so they're not that good for, say, a constant acceleration, like for detecting gravity, but they're very good for high frequency vibration. So a lot of times these are the types of accelerometers you'll see used for studying structural dynamics at higher frequencies. You're not worried about low frequency and constant gravity. You're worried about high frequencies up in the kilohertz range. Another type of piezoelectrics that you can find are these PVDF type sensors, which are actually pretty cheap. The three dollar uh, little piezo sensor that you can buy from places like SparkFun online currently, and uh, these are piezo, so you get really good signal out of these. But again, they don't hold a DC very well, but they could do do well for dynamic vibration, and uh, again, very cheap. So as long as you can add some signal conditioning, you can get some pretty decent. Uh, use out of them. Certainly they capture dynamic vibration very well, but if you want to detect, for example, gravity, it won't, uh, it won't uh, do very well at doing that. So now just let me review the uh, different specifications and how you can find them. Again, accelerometer output, which is going to be a voltage output in our case, uh, it's going to depend on two things, right? The amplitude of vibration in terms of acceleration, uh, which is commonly measured in Gs. And also, remember, it's also going to depend on the frequency of the base acceleration. So if you think of the motion, the uh, least displacement being something like Y, some amplitude with some frequency omega. Now, this is a driving frequency, right? Um, the amplitude that this mass is going to be sensitive to is actually omega squared times y. That gives you the amplitude of the acceler acceleration. Remember, these are some basic vibration relationships that we that we um, 
talked about in a related lecture on vibration modeling. Um, just trying to get you to think about the different quantities that are used in the specifications. Again, frequency and amplitude, and those are important when you're th talking about selecting and using accelerometers. So here's a general specification page for the um, type of accelerometer that we're using in, in this course. These are um, accelerometers that are available actually with up to three axes, either single axis, they're sensitive either to one axis or to three, up to three. And the one that we're using actually is, is uh, the CXL04LP3, so it's a three axis accelerometer. And the important specs that I want you to look at are input range, I got the red arrows here on there. The uh, sensitivity, which is uh, kind of like a calibration, you see that's in millivolts per G. And I'll talk more about the values as I go over each of these shortly. And here's the bandwidth, talk about that. And also another important spec is the uh, zero G output. Note there's a lot of other specifications here that you can look at. I'm just gonna talk about those three that are most relevant for our lab. So here's a typical calibration page actually for one of these accelerometers. Um, all of these spec pages, if you look at your accelerometer, you'll see that each one has a serial number. You can look up the specific and speci uh, the specific uh, sensitivity and zero G voltage for each of these. There's a breakout here that tells you what each of these pins represents. There's colors, but there's also pin numbers. You actually, the way we've wired these up, you actually aren't going to see um, certainly the color of the wires, but uh, or even the pins. Uh, we have signals coming off for the three axes, uh, either X, Y, or Z, that you'll be able to uh, to uh, measure directly onto a data acquisition system. Note that all you need to provide is a uh, DC voltage of 5 volts. And also you ground one of the pins, the, the number 2 pin. Uh, you put power in 1, ground a 2, and then X, Y, Z comes off 3, 4, and 5. Very easy to use. There's some other specs here, but again, I'll talk about those shortly. Again, the input range. Make sure you look at that spec. That just tells you what is the maximum allowable acceleration. Um, in this case, for example, there's a this shows you might see on here a, a, a single axis accelerometer. Uh, the accelerometers that we're using, uh, at least for the current lab, um, are, have, a, have a range of 4G, so it's not real high. Um, 4G, right, that's about 40 meters per second squared, but we usually think of it in terms of Gs. So make note of that. Um, maximum range. The sensitivity is going to be found on your spec page, and I'm kind of detailing that out here for this one particular accelerometer. Um, on a one spec page. This is a triaxial accelerometer, and you'll be able to identify that because it'll show you this little triad on here and it shows you that this is in this is the x direction, y is lateral to that, and then z is up and down, right? So note that this circle here indicates that you're looking down at z. You know, it follows your right hand rule. Okay, so um, when you're looking at any one of these, note that uh, the x, it'll give you a different. Um, sensitivity for each one. These have been calibrated. They're roughly about half a volt per G. So right, so if you put one G in the X direction, right, you're going to see a half volt change in the output. The zero G voltage, so let's say gravity was in the Z direction. That means that X is not going to see G, right? It's not going to see gravity. So there's no, and it's not moving, there's no there's no acceleration in the X direction. The output that you would see for 0 G in the X direction would be 2.454, right? So that's your, your zero value. And you can check that. Um, hook it up to your MyDAC and look at the output under no G and you should see about 2.45 um, on the output. If you looked at the Z output, and, and it had a gravity on it, it would be shifted by, depending on the sign, right? If, if gravity was down, 
that would be positive. So it would be, uh, you should see like a three, about a three volt output, right? Because you'd have a 1G exciting it in the positive direction and it would add to the 0G voltage in the Z axis. You should be three output, three volts out from this channel, okay? Those are some things that you will want to think through as you're using this accelerometer. You're only going to be using one axis when we do our experiments, but just so that you're aware of how to use these three axis accelerometers. Finally, bandwidth. What that talk, what that refers to is, is really the range of frequencies that the accelerometer is going to be sensitive over, right? And um, the spec on this accelerometer said that it had DC to 100 hertz. And what does this mean? Well, DC means that it can measure down to zero hertz. So DC is um, zero frequency, basically. And um, so it's sensitive to constant acceleration. What that means is that if you excite one of the axes of this accelerometer with a constant G, zero frequency, right? So you put a constant G, meaning the Earth's gravity, it will read that, so it's kind of nice because then you can you can detect the direction of gravity, but it, it shifts right uh, the uh, the output depending on what how much of the gravitational field that it'll see. The upper range of the bandwidth is 100 hertz on this uh, accelerometer, and that's as accelerometers go uh, relatively low, but Again, for our purposes, which is relatively low frequency vibration in this lab, this is actually a very good accelerometer. Um, this is also a good accelerometer for, uh, say, you were doing biomechanics experiments, even for a lot of vehicle vibration uh, testing. 100 hertz is pretty decent. Now, if you're trying to measure structural vibration on um, stiffer uh, systems, packaging systems, aircraft, uh, and so on, 100 hertz would be way too low. So you'd want to find an accelerometer that has a much higher frequency range. The other thing to know is not all accelerometers have a bandwidth that goes down to DC. I put this here as a note, like, and as I mentioned, piezoelectric type uh, will not read DC. Um, they roll off, if you like, on the low frequency, so um, you can't read um, a constant value. Right, so if you were to turn the sensitive axis of a piezoelectric accelerometer to uh, be um, sensitive to the Earth's gravitational field, it would basically read zero, right? Because it can't read a constant. Now you start shaking it at a certain frequency above four or five hertz, it'll it'll read that, right? And just to show you the way manufacturers report this bandwidth, usually it'll be in a frequency chart this way, and this is a frequency response. So here's the one for the accelerometer type that we have. You'll see it shows uh, the vertical axis here is sensitivity, and it shows it flat uh, up about 200 hertz is good, and then up down here you see it starts degrading. Okay, so that means use it only in the 100 hertz range. Here's another accelerometer, same thing flat out about to 200 hertz. This is a different accelerometer specification page. And similar, here's a, actually here's a piezoelectric type. Note how this one, it only reports the frequency response down to 200 hertz. They assume that a piezoelectric type, this is a Berlin care type accelerometer, you're not gonna be using it down here because you're gonna be doing structural vibration to see how much higher it goes. It can they could go up to about 5,000 hertz. So the bandwidth really, you wouldn't want to use it here where there's a resonance. Now I've already mentioned the output at zero G. So if you have your accelerometer with the sensitive axis not excited by any gravity, then you have zero Gs in that axis. So that output will be um, your zero G voltage which, uh, as you can see, for each, each axis has a different value. And uh, now the output, when you do excite that axis, will have a span of plus or minus 2 volts, right? And that makes sense. What you have is 4G and each 
uh, direction times about half volt per G, right? Which would give you plus or minus two volts in each direction. So you can imagine the output's going to range from about 0 0.5 to about four and a half volts uh, out, uh, going from negative 4G peak to plus 4G. Finally, a little um, quick test that you can do with accelerometer when you have it set up in the lab. Um, say you held it here and this was your sensitive axis and here's gravity and uh, let's say that's positive up and and say it was exposed to 1g what will it read when it's in this configuration and let's say these are your sense your, your sensitivities and your 0g voltages try to answer this and see if, if you have a good understanding of it an interesting way to check your calibration very quickly is whatever this reading is if you now tilt your accelerometer right slowly and reverse it what you've done is you've changed the excitation at the DC of this accelerometer right from by the way this is a negative G 1G now the sensitive axis when you re, when you turn it over is going to be excited by positive 1G, right? They're aligned here. So you've done a, a complete 2G change. So expect that whatever output voltage you had here, it has changed by, right, 2G. So think about it. If your sensitivity is half a volt, then for every G, you should have seen a 1 volt change, right, when you changed it by 2G, whether it went more positive or more negative, depending on what your answer is up here. Okay, This is a 2G test. Try that out when you're in the lab. It's a useful way to make sure that your accelerometer is, is, is working correctly. Okay, in summary, again, accelerometers take advantage of basic mass spring damper systems to work. So they have a dynamic response. They're sensitive across frequency, and that tells us something about how the sensitivity depends on input forcing frequency, and this defines the bandwidth. Okay, it's helpful to recognize then that accelerometers are responsive to both the amplitude, the level of vibration in G's, and also to a particular frequency that it's being excited at. Okay, one last little quiz for you: What would you see? Let's say you had two accelerometers. You had a DC accelerometer, like the one we have, right? It can read constant gravity. And let's say you also had one um, that had a low bandwidth at 10 hertz, like a piezo type, right? So it can't read a DC. And let's say you were doing a little 2G test. Would you be able to tell the difference between one just by looking at the results from a 2G test? Right. One's going to have an output that changes when you do a 2G. What would the output look like for a piezo type if you excited it by 2G at a DC level? Kind of a tricky question if you don't understand the previous slide, but something to think about.